الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته And I left you last week with the point of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's journey in his life where he had been going through a year of sadness in which the Prophet Sallallahu suffered a lot from the enemies of Islam especially in the city of al Ta'if, and we explained that last week of what happened to him and then after that I spoke about the relief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him immediately after he turned to him in his dua of complaint to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of what had happened to him. And we mentioned that there are two types of complaints in a person's dua. One is the uh, disbelief, kufr, and the other one is actually the heart of tawheed, the exact contrast. And that is when a person complains to Allah questioning why he did what he did to him and going against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qadr. And the other one is the tawheed type of complaint. And that is when you turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling him about your problems and asking him to relieve you of them. And only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really is al mushtaka Complaint really should be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A Muslim does not seek the attention and pity and sympathy of people. A person seeks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. And then I spoke about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to him the relief. The first one was a gift of grapes from one of the enemies of the Prophet one of the head enemies named Utbah, who owned that grapevine land with his slave named Addas, who was a Christian. And then Addas becomes a Muslim at the hands of the Prophet immediately. So that's a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling him that I have not left you alone. And although these people that you want to buy are not the ones who are going to listen to you, there are others who are going to, inshallah, by the will of Allah, follow you. So my brothers and sisters, Rasul sees Addas embracing Islam, even though he did not intend to give da'wah to Addas himself. He just said, Bismillah, eating a bit of grapes. And he asked him a couple of questions. The Prophet replied a couple of simple answers. Addas was at his feet kissing them. He said, he's the messenger of Allah. <laughs> Subhanallah. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, this is the message and the lesson from there. So after that, we mentioned last week that the jinns embraced Islam and they started to listen to the words of the Prophet Again, we see the hidayah is in the hands of Allah. The Prophet did not know that the jinns were going to come around and listen to the Qur'an while he's reciting. Rasulullah was bleeding blood from head to toe from what had happened in Al-Ta'if from the throwing of the rocks at him. And he got up into Hajjud on his way back to, to Mecca, halfway back, praying in the night. As he's reciting the Qur'an, the jinns heard the Qur'an. And behold, the time when we brought to you, we brought the jinns to you. It wasn't like uh, the Prophet ﷺ went out like he went to a ta'if. They came, Allah brought them to the Prophet ﷺ. Another sign of Hidayah. And when they heard the Qur'an, they said to each other, be quiet. And they started speaking about this Qur'an in high fashion. They went back to their people and they became like messengers after the messenger, like advocates or mini messengers of the Prophet ﷺ to the, the jinns and the shayat and, and their people. Then the Prophet ﷺ arrived in Mecca. Now, we go back to the lecture last week. You see so many lessons there. The Prophet ﷺ, you know, forgiving the people of Al-Ta'if and Although he could have asked the angel to crush them, he wouldn't do that. And Rasulullah look what happened to him. He's bleeding from head to toe. The people are throwing the rocks at him. They have, they have slandered him. They have abused him. The angel of the mountains comes by command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah has given the Prophet ﷺ the permission to go ahead. If you want, he will crush them and take them off the earth, off the earth completely till they become extinct. Permission from Allah. Yet the Prophet ﷺ said, no, 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 maybe after them there'll be those who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brothers and sisters in Islam, next the Prophet ﷺ arrived back in Mecca. And we know that his uncle Abu Talib had died and he had no more protection. So the Prophet ﷺ needed 
a chief, a chieftain of one of the tribes to give him protection. So in those days, you, the only way you were protected is um, if you belonged to a lineage of one of the of one of the tribes, one of the Arab tribes in Mecca, that you are protected under them. Or the other way you can be protected is that one of these Arabs tribes. They give you, they declare protection, they give you protection, asylum, and everyone else backs off. So the Prophet ﷺ had no other choice but to do it this way. So he called, sent message to a couple of the chieftains which he thought can help him. And then those two whom he sent to later on actually embraced Islam, later on, years later, Fatha Makkah. And one of them is Suhail ibn Amr, and the other one is Al Akhnas. And they politely or respectfully said no, they declined it. They wouldn't give him protection. So Prophet ﷺ was stuck now. And then he sent to another of the chiefs whom he knew had great character and good values. His name was Mut'im ibn Adi. Mut'im ibn Adi. He was a disbeliever and he died a disbeliever. However, he had good values. And the Prophet ﷺ sent to him if he would give him asylum and protection. Even though he was a kafir, but necessities dictate exceptions. If you find a Muslim to give protection, you go to the Muslim, of course, and trust him more. Sometimes a non-Muslim can also be trustworthy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does acknowledge to certain people of the book in the Quran. He even acknowledged that among the people of the book, there are those who are so trustworthy. If you give him a camel load of wealth to look after it for you, they will. And some of them, you give them one dinar, just a coin, they will not be trusted. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, he sent to Mut'am ibn Adi, and Mut'am ibn Adi accepted to give the Prophet ﷺ protection. He told him, come to the Ka'b over there and I'll meet you there. So, and this Mut'am sent six or seven of his sons, his own sons. He told them, go and wear your swords and cover them. In those days, wearing your sword uncovered, unsheathed, means that you are ready to fight. Covering it means you are security guard, you are guard. So they gathered around the Prophet and the Prophet made tawaf. Abu Sufyan, one of the great leaders of Quraysh, comes up to Mut'am ibn Adi and he says to him, What's this? Have you followed him or are you protecting him? And he said, No, we are protecting him. So then Abu Sufyan said, Okay, then, then if you're protecting him, we will not harm Had he said we followed him, Abu Sufyan was ready to get the Arabs against Mutaim and his tribe and fight them as well. SubhanAllah. My brothers and sisters in Islam, so the Prophet for the next two years, he was protected by Mutaim ibn Adi. Some ulama say about three years, but two years before he went to Hijrah. This was about two years before his Hijrah, or maybe three years for the Hijrah. You know the Hijrah? The Hijrah? When he migrated from Mecca to Medina, it's a huge, huge thing. This is the mark, the turnaround of Islam. And after that, the victory and the expansion of Islam. So my brothers and sisters, what happened now? The Prophet ﷺ has gone through this suffering. And by the time Mut'am ibn Adi gave him protection, he said, he said, the Prophet ﷺ said, after the death of my uncle, I had no protection and I had never seen more harm from my people in Quraysh than the days when my uncle died and I had no protection. Even his own other uncle Abu Lahab used to follow the Prophet I mean, the Prophet peace be upon him did not stop da'wah. He did not stop calling even in that situation. Even in that situation. Just like he said to his uncle Abu Talib when he was alive, Oh my uncle, Wallahi, I will not leave this call. Either I keep calling until they embrace or I keep calling until I am destroyed. I will not stop. I will die in this place. And that's what he did exactly. He returned back knowing that his life is at stake and continued. Uh, the Sahaba say he used to walk in the markets and around the Kaaba and still say to every Arab tribe, all of them, all of them, oh Arab tribes, oh, okay, I cannot save you from Allah. I am the messenger of Allah. Obey me and you will win the world and the hereafter. And people still mock him. Some, as he, in fact, as soon as he entered Mecca, one man comes along, grabs some clay and dust from the earth 
and threw it at the Prophet's head and his hair and his hair filled his whole head he entered his home and his daughters were there and they started to clean it off while Fatima was crying I mean, it was just too much for them all these years it's just too much the Prophet would say to Fatima don't worry my daughter don't worry Allah is going to give your father victory he is not going to leave him alone so it was a very very tough time subhanAllah only because he said my Lord is Allah and he used to say to them same words I am not forcing you to Islam I just request from you to give me safety and then if you want to listen listen if you don't want to listen there is no compulsion but give me safety to speak that's all I ask of you this is all the Prophet asked in Mecca nothing more nothing less nothing more nothing less but unfortunately they didn't they kept going so after that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to give the Prophet another nice relief and the next thing that happened was not something that we hold on to as uh, you know the most major part of the seerah or the most major part of our religion and uh, you'll find that in this next incident that I'm about to tell you about you'll find that there are different versions and narrations about it and uh, there's bits of information we still know, bits of information we don't know. So we're not going to stick to every point of it. There are some weak hadiths about it, some things that are fabricated, some things that are true. But I'm going to go through the main points that interest us, inshallah, and which are important to us in the biography of the Prophet which is Al Isra wal Mi'raj. Al Isra wal Mi'raj. Now, before I go on, I can see, I, can, I probably feel, I feel that some people will think, what are you saying? This is not a major thing you know it is a major thing it's a great miracle from Allah subhanahu wa and it marked a very important time in the seat of the Prophet but it's not something that you can grab and use as a dalil for everything in your life it's something that Allah subhanahu wa wanted the Prophet to feel a closeness to him and that he is protecting him and he is comforting him so the Isra al Ma'raj number one we don't know the exact date in which Al Isra al Maraj occurred. Al Isra means to travel by night to a far distance. Al Maraj means to ascend, to go upwards into the heavens. It did happen. It happened because Allah said it happened in the Quran, in Surah Al Isra. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, how perfect is he? Subhana means how perfect is he? Or how far away from imperfection is he? When you say subhanAllah, it means how far away from imperfection of life. How perfect is he? Who took his slave, Muhammad by night from the Masjid of Haram in Mecca, the Kaaba of Mecca, all the way to the farthest mosque, Al Aqsa, in Jerusalem. In order to show him among our signs, indeed, Allah is all hearer, all knower, all hearer, all knower, all hearer. Afwan al Basir, isn't that correct? I'm saying, al Basir, inna huwa sami' al Basir. It's your fault. Verily, Allah is the all hearer, the all seer. And why is it the all hearer, all seer? It means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had heard the plight and dua of his messenger So he gave him an Isra al Ma'raj as a gift to comfort him وسلم, and to honor him after the degradation that they gave him, after the humiliation that they gave him. وسلم, yet he is the most honorable in the universe. In the universe. And. Inna wa sami'u al basir the all seer Allah is saying, as though Allah is saying, He has seen what His Messenger has gone through. So He gave him His gift. So we don't know the exact date. And I'd like to make an important point here, so please listen attentively. Some ulama, this is one of the most controversially uh, conflicted. 
uh, opinions among the scholars past and present, amongst even the greatest historians, on when Isra al Maraj actually happened. Some say it was on the 27th of Raja. Some say it was in Shawwal, like now. I mentioned last week that Isra al Maraj happened in Shawwal, but I take that back and I say Allahu A'lam. They are all weak narrations. Some ulama said Rabi' al Awwal, the first month of the Hijri calendar. Some said five years before the Hijra, and others said one year before the Hijra. Although every single one of them is weak in their narration, every single one of them is weak in their narration, unanimously agreed by all the scholars of Hadith and historians, it seems that the least weakest one that the ulama agree on mostly is that he traveled to Israel Maraj one year before the Hijra and most likely in Rabi' al awwal Not sure, but most likely. And in fact, the, the most unauthentic one and the most uh, narration that has little to no that source proper source is Raja. And you'll find that if you looked up in the internet, they will tell you Raja. 27th of Raja. So I only, my brothers and sisters, I speak the truth to you through knowledge that Allah has guided me to. And I wish that I can tell you exactly when it was. But what this tells us is this. If Isra al Ma'raj, the date was so important, then the Sahabas would have remembered it, possibly celebrated that occasion, made a huge deal about that occasion. But it's actually wrong that we see many Muslims in the world today turning this particular day into a type of celebration. Some of them, to a lesser extent, they say it's a night of remembrance. They just water it down a little. But to be honest with you, my brothers and sisters, without ridiculing or putting down anybody, and while respecting some of the Mashaya who said it's okay to do it as a remembrance, I still tell you, my brothers and sisters, it's not from the Sunnah of the Prophet and that's the truth. My brothers and sisters in Islam, Asra al Maraj then took place. And there is a long story, a long narration in Sahih Bukhari, and one in Sahih Muslim. And in almost every hadith book, in the six books of authentic books we call this, the six sources of Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, Ibn Majah, Abu Dawood, and Nisa. So these are the most relied upon, even though there are other books of hadith that are also relied upon. Uh, many like the Muwatta Ibn Malik, and the Muwatta Ibn Imam Malik, and, and many others. Nevertheless, my brothers and sisters, among them are many weak and fabricated hadith, so here we go and show. And the ones I am comfortable to tell you, I will say them inshallah. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was lying down in the hijr, the hijr of Ismail. Whoever has gone to Mecca will see that around the Kaaba there is a small semicircle that people enter and can exit where the spout uh, that uh, drains the water from the roof is situated. That's called Hijr Ismail. That's actually part of the Kaaba. The Prophet was lying on his back in the Hijr, and with him it is said that his uncle Hamza was with him, and it is said that Ja'far ibn Abi Talib was with him. I'm not sure about this narration, but he was there, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and then he said that someone came to him. This someone is an angel, and with him was Jibreel. Some narrations say it was Mikael and Israfi. Allah knows best, but there were definitely two angels. One of them was definitely Jibreel. And they took me, they asked me to stand up and took me outside to the Zamzam fountain, Zamzam water. They lied me on the floor, and the Prophet said, They cut my chest from here to here. So from his sternum, they cut it up all the way to just below his belly buttons. And they took my heart out and washed it in Zamzam three times. Then they brought some other substance and they placed it into my heart 
which is the substance of hilm, they say, knowledge and patience and other things, as though they were preparing him for a journey that the heart cannot handle of a normal human being. You might be asking now, is this in a dream or is it in actual body and soul? Or did he just go by in his soul? I say to you, my brothers and sisters, without a doubt, that the ulama, the majority of them, and the strongest dalil is that he went in body and soul. Otherwise, otherwise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wouldn't have mentioned it like that. He said, how perfect is Allah who took his slave by night. He didn't say he took his soul by night. Because a slave is not a soul. A slave is a nafs. Is a nafs. And a nafs, with unanimously agreed in the Arabic language among all the scholars, is a nafs is made up of soul and body and mind together. If they are part, they are no longer a nafs. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he called it, he said, a slave of Allah by, by night. He didn't say his ruh. He didn't. That's number one. Number two, he took him in his body. When the Prophet returned from the journey, we all know that the Quraysh, the Kuffar of Quraysh, they disbelieved in him and they mocked him. Why would they mock him if he had told them that it was a dream? Nobody would mock him. They said, oh, well, it's in a dream. All of them used to see dreams. You go you know, in long places. They've got poetry. Arabs that in the dream they traveled for a year. And the Prophet traveled in less than a month. He went to Al-Aqsa in what would take less than a month. Also, so they wouldn't have gone all out against him. Therefore, there's another dalil that he went in his body, my brothers and sisters. Otherwise, in a third thing, why would it be a miracle? It's not a miracle that somebody dreamt of them traveling the universe and planets. It's not a miracle. The miracle of the prophets. So this was definitely one of the mujizat, one of the ayat, one of the miracles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did. And one of so far, the biggest test, the biggest physical test on the hearts of those who have just embraced Islam and uh, those who are thinking of embracing My brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah only wants sincerity. So He took Him in His body and His soul. By night. He said, A beast was brought to me that looked like something between the, 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 the size of a mule and a horse, something in between. And it was a very handsome looking creature. It had a mane, it was white in color, its face was beautiful, it had a nice color to it, and it had two massive wings on its hind hips, which assisted it in jumping very far. And I came to climb on it, then it became stubborn. And Jibreel wiped the mane of, the, of this creature and said to it, Are you being stubborn when the best of creation is climbing on top of your back? And it says in the narration that this creature looked like a horse. It started to sweat and humbled itself before the Prophet And Jibreel said, This is Al-Buraq. Al-Buraq means the creature named after the lightning. It travels like lightning, very fast. It is the vehicle of all the prophets that came before. These are in authentic hadiths. Now I'm not going to go through all the technicalities because we'll stay here all night. But if you want to look it up, it's available inside Bukhari and Muslim and other things. And the Prophet ﷺ said, any place this Buraq, this, the eyesight of the Buraq reached, it took one leap and it got there with one leap. Wherever its eye lands. This is the same explanation as Sahih Bukhari. If it went up a mountain, its hind legs extended and its wings assisted. And if it was going down a mountain or straight, its front legs extended and its wings assisted. This is all we have in the description that I can tell you. He went and the one I'm about to tell is not in Bukhari or Muslim, it's in the other books of Hadith. 
passed by several places. On the first leap, he stopped, he got down and he prayed. And then Jibreel Aisalam said, you know this place? This is, he said, this palm tree says, this is Medina, where your hijrah is going to be. And then he had another leap. And then he prayed and Jibreel Aisalam said, you know this place is? This is Madian. This is the place where Musa salam came, arrived, where Shu'aib salam was, and assisted Allah Ta'ala with Shu'aib, a, a noble man, and he married those, that, that woman there. Then he leaped again and he prayed. He said, this is the Mount Sinai, Turi Sayna, where Musa salam spoke to his Lord. And then he leaped again and he landed. He said, I saw palaces of Asham, of Syria. Syria in those days is not Syria, Syria today. Syria means greater Syria. When you said Syria in the history books, it meant Syria, Lebanon, modern day Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Jordan, and parts of Turkey. That was Syria. If you read Syria in the books of historians, Arab Muslim historians, it means Asham, all that kind of stuff. He said, I could see the palaces of Syria. And I prayed there again. And uh, he said, this is the place which is called Beit Lahm, Bethlehem, where Isa alayhi salam was born from Mary, Maryam alayhi salam. And then he reached Al-Aqsa, Masjid Al-Aqsa. And there he prayed Imam, Imam for the whole prophets from beginning to end. And that's why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam said, Ana Sayyidul Anbiya. I am the Sayyid, the, the, the master of, of the prophets. Master is just another way of saying the, the sir, or not the sir, the, the most honorable of all the prophets. He added, and I do not say it out of pridefulness. Because the Prophet came to all of Mecca and he received the final book of Allah. Allah had honored him that way. He prayed Imam of, with all the prophets in Masjid al-Aqsa and then he climbed out and Allahu Alam was there or up in Bayt al-Ma'mur, another Kaaba in the heavens. But I'll just say it now. He said, I was offered two drinks. One says uh, three drinks, but the Sahih narration is two drinks, inshallah. Milk and alcohol, wine. And I immediately reached out to the milk and drank it based on my own instinct. And Allahu A'lam, some of them might say that alcohol had not been forbidden yet. And the Prophet ﷺ automatically went for the milk. And Jibreel salam said, You have targeted the natural instinct that Allah created every human to be on. You have chosen purity. And, and this is exactly what Allah is going to legislate for your ummah. He will only legislate for them purity. What they eat and drink of halal is pure for them. And whatever he forbids will be impure. And wine, of course, is impure. What does impure mean, my brothers and sisters? Why is the pig haram to eat, for example? Why is the alcohol haram to drink? What does it mean that it is haram or impure? It means that our bodies and the way Allah created it is not immunely fit to digest and to have this haram food. And for example, a pig can eat feces, can drink urine. It's okay, it's halal for the pig. Why? Because Allah created its digestive system for that. He allowed the tiger and the lion to eat animals, but not the, the, the beasts to eat anything. But we are not allowed. Why? Because the beast's digestive system is fit for that. It's haram for us because it is impure for our digestive system. It's not fit for our bodies because it's harmful to you. And that's the only reason why haram is haram and halal is halal. Allah ahalala tayyibat, the pure things for us. He forbid upon you things that are impure for your body and your system and your mind. That's the only reason. Next time you hear why is something haram? Well, it's because it's harmful to you. Why is something halal? Because it's good for you. So if you don't want to use the word halal and haram because it sounds too much for a person, too dogmatic for some people, why? Just say, well, it's good for you and this is bad for you. It's the same as saying halal and haram. But who is the one that said it's good and bad? Allah. That's the only difference. That Allah is the one who told you it's good, this is bad. My brothers and sisters in Islam, then the Prophet was brought a ladder. A ladder. 
Now you might be thinking the letter that the carpenter makes. No, we don't know exactly what this letter is like. It's a letter beyond the supernatural, supernatural type of world. But it's the most beautiful letter, and it extends in a way that we don't, we can't understand. We can't understand. So it's a type of thing that rises. It's like saying the ozone layer. When you go there, you don't feel a particular layer that you can touch. They call it a layer. But it has a different, different, uh, different characteristics. So this letter has a different characteristics, and Rasulullah sallallahu climbed it. Jibril is with him. Jibril alayhi salam is with him. But Jibril alayhi salam is in a different form. He's in the form of a human. He's not in his real form. He climbed up. It was very quick. Very quick. And they reached the worldly sky. In Arabic, in the Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, He created seven skies on, after each other. And you might say on top, but they're not on the top of it. Like on top as in, as in space, you don't know what's up, what's side, what's down. Tibaqa, layers upon layers. Like this, like that, we don't know, but there are layers on layers. Seven universes, and scientists are, astronomers, astronomers are looking into theories of whether there are multi universes multiverses. Allah knows best how they are, but he said he created seven layers by universes. So in Arabic, sky means space. It doesn't mean, or when you say heaven, heaven, sorry, it means space. Sama, space. Sama. For example, was a yanna sama al dunya bizinatin al kawak. And we have decorated the, he- the worldly heaven, meaning space, space, space. with stars and planets. So, Sama means space. It's universe. He will it reach the worldly sky. And there was an angel. And Jibreel a.s. knocked and said, Let us through, open the gates. Allahu alam what these gates are like. Even in scientific terms, they have gates in the universe, but they're different gates. So, it's not unusual for Prophet to say gate. And this angel said, Who is it? He said, He is Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah. And he said, Has he been called? He said, Yes. And then he said, Welcome. And he's part of our family, the Messenger of Allah, the best creator, the best of creation. He opened the gate for him and he entered the first sky. Rasulullah said, In the first sky, I saw a tall man. I looked up, I could barely see his face from how tall he was. And he was extremely, he looked very handsome and very beautiful. Jibreel Aisalam said, that is your father Adam, greet him. So I greeted him and Adam replied to me, the greeting, he said, welcome my dear son and messenger of Allah, how blessed you are. There's more to the story, but I'll just cut it short now. I'll just say what's important. Then he went to the second sky, and the gatekeeper of the second sky, the angel, repeated the same thing. And Jibreel Salam said the same thing. He said, has he been called? He said, yes, and he welcomed him and opened the second gate. He said, I went to the second sky, and there I saw the two cousins, my brothers Yahya and Isa, salam. Jesus Christ, salam, and John, alayhi salam. And he greeted them, they greeted him back, and the Prophet ﷺ gives them, gives them a brief description. He says, Isa alayhi salam was a tanned color, tanned complexity, with redness in his cheek, more to the white side. When the Arabs said white, it doesn't mean white white, uh, British white, uh, European white, or Caucasian, no. When the Arabs said white, it means compared to the darkness of the Arabs, they're white. Meaning they are brownish, light brownish, like that. Uh, olive complexion, that's that's white to the Arabs. When you say, abyal, 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 abyal. So, uh, they used to call the really white people, like the, the British, for example, the, the Byzantines and Romans, asfal. They used to call them yellow in Arabic, asfal. So just so you know, when you read, you know what they're talking about. So Isa salam was a darker complexion and he said he had curly hair, it was long up to his shoulders and he had it down as if he had just come out of the shower and just left it. 
it looked like water was dripping from it. It was his natural hair. So it was quite a handsome one, Isa alayhi salam, and his cousin Yahya. They greeted each other, and Prophet went to the third sky. Same thing happened. They welcomed him. And there in the third sky, he said, I saw Yusuf alayhi salam, Joseph. He said, Wa if be here, behold, before me was a man so magnificently beautiful in face that he had been given Shatla al half of beauty of the earth. He was like, he said, described it like the full moon when you see it compared to the stars. He just stood out. You have a trillion people in front of him and he will stand out like the way the full moon stands out compared to the stars. You won't notice the stars much anymore around. So he was beautiful. And this signifies a symbol of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, standing out. So Yusuf Alayhi stood out and Allah was going to create Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi to be one who stands out. Then he went to the fourth sky, same thing happened, they welcomed him and there Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw Idris, Prophet Idris Alayhi Enoch. He didn't say much about Idris except that Allah tells us in the Quran We lifted Idris to a high place. Then he went this signifies that the Prophet has been honored and lifted high. Then he went to the fifth sky, and in the fifth heaven he saw Harun, Aaron, Harun السلام, the brother of Musa. And Harun السلام, was extremely handsome. The Prophet describes him in the following description He had a very long beard that reached his navel, massive. And he said almost half of it was white and half of it was black, not like literally in the middle. Like half black, half white, distributed. Okay? Don't go off now thinking I can die in a bizarre way, half my hair white and half my black. No. So that's how he looks all about Alayhi Salam. He said he looks so handsome and beautiful, very welcoming. And uh, Jibril Alayhi Salam said to him, This is your brother Harun, greet him, he greeted him back. And he said, he is, he, he, His people love him. And he saw people around him that were loving Harun. And truly Harun was a type that was extremely kind to his people and the people loved to talk to him more than what they loved to talk to his brother Musa right? Although Musa was more important. But Harun kind of covered for that side of Musa the rough side of Musa with the kind side. So there's nothing wrong with some Muslims and when they're called, you've got a, a bit of a tough approach, some of them have a firm approach, some of them have a softer approach. Allah SWT created us that way, all of us help in the so my brothers and sisters in Islam, that was her. Then he went to the sixth sky. In the sixth heaven, he saw Musa alayhi salam. He said, what if he, he describes it. He says, he was rough looking. Like the hardcore men, strong men of Yemen. Very dark. Coarse hair. And he was so hairy. This, is, this signifies lots of testosterone. He was a very strong man. Wide shouldered, wide broad. The people really, when they saw Musa Asam, they just, they went quiet, the children of Israel. And he, a man like him was needed for the children of Israel, because they were very stubborn people. And Musa alayhi salam, uh, uh, very masculine. And uh, Prophet Asam greeted him, he greeted him back, and then he cried. Musa alayhi salam started to cry. And he asked, why are you crying? And he said, because I hoped that Allah gave me the largest ummah. Children of Israel is the second largest ummah nation of a prophet. Musa alayhi salam said, I cried that another prophet came after me, that Allah gave him a larger ummah than mine that will enter paradise. And I couldn't get all my people into paradise, so I'm crying for them. And yet, I wish I could be at your stage, Ya Rasulullah. But you, and they say that I am the best, but you are the best. You, Ya Rasulullah, are the most valuable. So they were all humble with each other. But still he was emotional because he wanted to be the one who could make the most of his people into paradise. And this is how the Prophet Sama, brothers and sisters, they are merciful. They really, truly and honestly want to save their people. Muhammad Sallallahu was said to all the So then he went to the seventh sky and there he saw Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. The Prophet Sallallahu was so proud to see Ibrahim alayhi salam. Why? Because he is his great, great, great ancestral grandfather. Prophet Sallallahu came from the bloodline of Ibrahim And he describes how he looks like. But this is all he says. He looked at his companions and he said, what did he look like, Ya Rasulullah? He said, Look at me. This is what he looks like. 
I look like my father Ibrahim alayhi salam. He is the father of the prophets. Ibrahim alayhi salam comes next in line after Muhammad uh, salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam greeted him and all that. Now, now, at the sixth, at heaven, the sixth heaven, heaven, the Prophet alayhi salam saw something. Saw something. He saw the beginning, the trunk, the trunk of a special tree called a Sidrat al the lotus tree. Lot tree. The last lot tree. There is nothing after it. But he saw it in the sixth heaven. In the Hadith in Zayn Muslim. The one in Bukhari, it says in the seventh heaven. And the ulama said, therefore, it begins in the sixth heaven and ends in the seventh heaven. Massive. Sixth heaven, seventh heaven is like, each one is like a ring thrown into a desert compared to the next. Seventh heaven, the tree is massive. It is the last of Allah's creation before his throne and his kursi. There is nothing after the love tree, nothing. The Sidrat Al-Muntaha, it's in Surah Al-Najm. The last creation of the seven heavens and below. There is no, there's no people after, no angels, nothing. He said, this tree was so magnificent that I find it difficult to describe it and I'll tell you some things, but the rest of it, I don't know. It's not of this world. He says, its leaves are massive. They are like, look like the ears of elephants, so they're very big leaves. Its color, I cannot describe. We are used to colors. Can you imagine a color? He said, I don't know, what, I don't know what to call it. He says, it's surrounded by things that I could only say they are like golden butterflies. I don't know what they are, but they look like something around it that keeps moving. It's never stable. And the colors keep changing. I cannot describe the colors for you. Allahu Akbar. But he said, it is the most magnificent, beautiful thing I have ever laid my eyes on to the point where I can't even describe it. And Rasulullah is so eloquent. I can't, I don't know. I can't tell you the colors. It keeps changing. It keeps changing. And what is this tree? The ulama tell us, according to the evidence, that you know when you do good deeds, what happens to your good deeds? Where do they go? What does Allah say in the Quran about your good deeds? Number one, good words that you say, beautiful words that you say that Allah is pleased with. To him ascend. And where do they go? Sidrat al Muntah. And from there, So your good words go to the low tree. And from there, the pure words, its rewards, the actions of goodness, the actions your amal al salih, he lifts it to you. And then Allah rewards by descending the reward. He comes back to the low tree, and the angels take it from the low tree and distribute its rewards. Allahu A'lam, this is how the ulama, the tafsir which I read in Ibn Kathir and Ghayru, that this is what the low tree is. It, it, it collects the good deeds and the beautiful words that you say. And it's quite ironic, it's amazing how Allah Subhanahu describes the example of a beautiful word like a beautiful tree. Its roots are very strong and its leaves extend and its fruit feed everybody. So always beautiful words are signified by beautiful trees. And you know, a tree is a symbol of peace and beauty and goodness. Always, in, in poetry, in the Quran, everywhere, in Arabic language, it's always signified of beauty and peace and goodness. And that's why whenever you say beautiful words, there are certain, as God Allah says, He plants for you a tree in Jannah. Trees are a symbol of goodness, purity and peace. So this is Sidrat al-Muntaha. When He reached the seventh sky, at the end of the low tree, suddenly He looks, and what does He see? He sees Jibreel alayhi salam has transformed back into his original form. Why? Allahu A'lam. Allahu A'lam, one of the interpretations say, Jibreel alayhi salam reached a point where his power had diminished because of the enormity and greatness of where he had reached. After that, there is no one but Allah. And we can't describe. We're not saying Allah is literally sitting on something or sitting on the Allah. But Allah has no limits. Beyond that, there is nothing. Allah is the only one. He feels he, Allah has no limits. Subhanahu wa And nothing can describe it. Nothing like nothing. 
But Jibreel Asalam reached that point and he went into his own form. Allah says this in the Quran. And he saw him at a second stage, another time. Where do we see him a second time? At the Sidrat al Muntaha. Just telling you where I got this information from. Over there is the beginning of the eternal paradise. And this tells us that the heavens he went through are not paradise, they are just universes. Al Jannah is above there. Al Jannah is about. I know some people that say, Brother, I want to go to the seventh paradise. I don't think this is true. There is Jannah, and that's it. And it's levels. It's levels. It's massive. It's levels. That's it. And it's after the seventh heaven. Wallahu a'lam. At Sidrat al Muntaha is Jannah al Ma'wa. Therefore, paradise of eternity begins there. Because Allah says, there is his eternal paradise, his paternal gardens. Jibreel stopped and he began to sweat and humbleness and paleness was on his face. Rasulullah said he had 600 wings which extended from the east to the west. And all of his might and his size and his greatness, he would not dare to take a single step further. He said, is this where the companion leaves his beloved Ya Jibreel? Jibreel said, La Ya Rasulullah. But if I take one more step, Allah, I will disintegrate to ashes. I will burn. This is too much. The Lord is too much even for me. What about me, Ya Jibreel? He says, as for you, Allah has chosen. Allah. That's Rasulullah is the best of his creations. True. Sallallahu alayhi wa He said, go forward, for Allah has called you. He went forward and there. Rasulullah describes. He says, there was a cloudiness or light which encompassed me. I could not see Allah, but I could hear Allah. I heard a voice. Now some people are going to say, Kufa, should you said voice. It's just terminology that we use, but we don't say like voice of humans or anything like that. It's just terminology. It's like the way Allah says He hears and sees. It doesn't mean He is like us and sees like us, but it's a terminology. Otherwise, this is what Allah said about Himself. Allah spoke to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and in the Arabic there is salt, there is voice. We don't know what it's like, but it's something that he heard. He heard Allah speak to him. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala gave him commands and all that stuff. Allah says in the Quran, فَأَوْحَى إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ مَا أَوْحَى He inspired to his slave whatever he has inspired. Now some of you might say, well it's wahi, see? He didn't speak. Well, I say to you, is in the Quran wahi? And it is speech, it is Allah's speech. So wahi can come in speech or in any other form. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet many, many things, some things the Prophet told us and some things he didn't tell us. Irrelevant. Many, many things. Many things for wisdom he didn't tell us. But the most important thing is what? He gave him three things that we need to know. The first one, the last verses of Surah Al-Baqarah. You can read that one. The second thing he gave him is something he never gave to any ummah before Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And he honored us the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. What was it? That. It's only for the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Never before. What is it? What is it? That. Man ha hamma ahad. I'll say it in English. If one of you intends, just thinks of doing something good that pleases Allah, and then doesn't do it, changes their mind, they will still get one good deed for merely thinking of doing it. And if he does it, he will be rewarded tenfold more than what it's worth to seventy folds if he wills, and some some people, depending on their intention, to seven hundred folds. Well, if, and if one of you intends, thinks of doing something bad, sin, and then changes their mind and doesn't do it, it will be written for him still as one good deed for the mere fact that he changed your mind. But if he does it, it is written as one bad thing. These are the minor sins. I'm major sin, like sin and killing. Say, ah, I'll get off. I'll kill the guy because I hate him. And it's only one bad thing. I'll go to the Umrah and told God. No, it doesn't work. We can't trick up. Minor sins. Brothers and sisters, this is only given to the Ummah of the Prophet. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him what? The 50 salawat. 50 prayers. He said, command your ummah to pray 50 prayers a day. Prophet prayed them himself, came down and met Musa 
Musa Asam asked him what did he command you? He said 50 prayers for my people. Musa Asam said, Your people are not going to be able to do it. My people were given less and they couldn't. Ask your Lord to give you less. So he went back and asked Allah for less. Allah gave him less. We don't know how many times he went back and forth. Some people do a calculation mathematically. 50 down to 5, therefore it'll be 10 times. No, that's not how it works. We don't know how many times. He went maybe five times, maybe three times, maybe six times. Allah But he went back and forth and Musa I said, and continued to tell him less, 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 they can't handle it until it reached five. five. Then, then Prophet Musa said to him, even less, my people were given less, they were given three salah. But I'm sorry, and they couldn't do it. Asked him for less. So then the Prophet said, I'm too embarrassed, I'm too shy to go back and ask him for even less than that. So I don't want to keep asking him. You know? And then the Prophet said, I heard a voice. And it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, This is what I have written upon the Muslims to pray. It had already been written, but the Prophet didn't know that. But why did the Prophet do that? Allah wants to honor the Prophet. He wants to honor him. Look what had happened to him. He wanted to gift it to him. It was already going to happen. Fine. But those, like some people might say, well, if he had gone back, we would have had to pray even less. Why? Why do you do this to us? I would have been that scuffle. You don't say why this to us. This was actually this hadith, which is Sahih Bukhari. Sahih Bukhari, it's there. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had said that this was already going to be the command. So in other words, he only did this for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam just to honor him and gift him. To make it look like it was shared. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala gave it to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to share this command as an honor for him. You get it? That's all it really was. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala often did that with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or with his companions like Umar radiallahu anhu would say something and Allah would send a verse just to honor him. So my brothers and sisters, this was the case. And so, but Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said in Hadith Al-Qudsi, however, I'm not sure if it's Hadith Al-Qudsi or the Hadith of the Prophet He said that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, however, still maintained, still kept that whoever prays the five prayers will be counted as if they pray 50 prayers. The reward stayed, but the physical amount went down. So if, when you pray Fajr, it's as if you prayed 10 Fajr. You pray Dhuhr, 10 Dhuhr. And so, on. and so on. That's from That's only for the Ummah of the Prophet out of his mercy subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the road to Jannah, my dear brothers and sisters, is easy. And we already have a head start. Wallahi, this is ajeeb, strange, heartbreaking, that people complain about even the five daily prayers. And some of them say to me, I can't do it, bro. Can you make dua for me? What should I do to do it? I say, you just do it. Just do it. Can you make dua for me to drink water? I'm always thirsty, but the taps that I can't go to. How do I do it? So you pick yourself up, you walk to the tap, and you put water in the, in, the, in the cup. Isn't that right? So you get up and you pray, that's it. <laughs> it's a wrong question. Make dua. What do you mean make dua? Allah has already guided you. Gave you hands, gave you legs, gave you legs. If you don't have legs and hands, then pray, pray with your head if you can't see, or if you're blind and you can't move and you're paralyzed. There's no excuse for it. How do you pray? By praying. Make dua. Allah already, already has already given you the My brothers and sisters in Islam, and so the salah has been written, and Rasulullah then descended. In his descension, he saw other things. So now he's seeing things. And he saw things of hellfire and things of Jannah. He saw many different signs. I'll, I won't go through it, but I'll leave you with it. You can read Sahih Muslim, Sahih Bukhari. Um, in the first part of it, there's like maybe 30 pages all about it. And there's so many different signs of people who drank alcohol and people who did some uh, But what I want to say is this finally. The Prophet ﷺ reached back to Mecca and he saw some signs along the way. Camels and people that were coming to Mecca. And the first one was Abu Jahl. He heard that Muhammad ﷺ was saying he went by night to Jerusalem and up to the sky and came back. And Abu Jahl thought, this is an opportunity for me to wipe the floor with his message. So he sits next to him at the Kaaba and he says, where were you last night? Is it true that you went to a rock in one night? He goes, yes. Prophet Sallallahu said, yes. He said, and then you just uh, appeared back here? He said, yes. He said, wow. Do you, do you allow me to tell the people? 
So Bujar wanted to say that so that if he calls the people the problem, he thought the prophet's not quite why he won't change it. Won't change. So he goes to the people and says, People, come, 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 Ya Abdul Manah, all this come and hear what you what the Muhammad has said. They sat down and he said, Is it true you went? He goes, Yes, yes. He said, and, and then they said, and he said you just appeared here? He said, Yes. Allahu Akbar. The first one was Abu Jahl to fall on his back, lift his legs up and laugh. Everybody's clapping their hands. Masha Allah. That's they didn't say Masha Allah, but they said something like that. Yani. Okay, that, that does it. That's it. That's, you know, I might as well just uh, just go and jump off a cliff. I don't know if I even exist anymore. He went at night, in the night, all the way to Jerusalem, comes back and he goes to the heavens. And can't get any better than that. Abu Jahl thought, this is it. So they called his friend Abu Bakr. Come here, this is it. Your friend that you've always said is the truth. What did he say? Went to Al-Aqsa, comes back, are you serious? Abu Bakr said, If he said it, then he said the truth. He said it, he said it, he said it. I believed him in something even more than that. That by morning and by evening, he receives revelation of a book from above seven heavens. And I believe that. Why would I not believe that he went to Al-Aqsa? It's easy. That's why he was called as siddiq the one who believes the Prophet without hesitation. He was given that title, the true believer, the siddiq one who honestly believes the Prophet You know, some historians say that some Muslims actually left their deen or had doubt in their deen after that. It was the greatest test. And he described, look, he describes, says, I saw a cavalry coming and they had lost one of their camels and I saw another camel that his, what it was carrying was broken. And he, and then asked him to describe the masjid and he described the pillars and how it looks like. He did all that stuff to the point where he just shut him up and he just sat down and said, all right, man, look, you got the descriptions right. And they waited three days later, the, the, the caravan came along and it was exactly as he described it. But instead, they all just shut up and just moved on. Nobody believed in what he, what he said, except those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had guided from a new, a new group of people who did not exist in Makkah but they had come from Medina. And only about 70 people in Mecca had converted to Islam. And some of them had already migrated to Abyssinia, and the ones that were left were probably about 70. All this 13, 14 years of da'wah, nothing more than about 100 and something, and 70 are left. So my brothers and sisters, this is Rasulullah. So be patient. The victory comes by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are patient and sincere. So this ends my talk for today. Jazakumullah khayyib wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.